Mosby comes out on a, on a lane that is between them and their camp. In other words, uh, they have to go through Mosby to get back to camp. There was a little uh, high grade on this hill uh, where the road was, and there he put a Napoleon cannon, a 12-pound Napoleon cannon. He stretched his men out. He also had carbineers, and these were guys with long guns, uh, good shots, uh, with long guns. And they started shooting at the Federals. Now, you can imagine the Federals were just, you know, like getting all excited and starting to move around and wanting to get back. Uh, he also had, had moved his men to a point where they were ready to attack. Uh, Forbes had moved up a couple of ranks of cavalry, ready to receive the charge. And sure enough, some guy in the back rank was, of course, the horses were getting all excited. Most had fired a cannibal over the heads of the cavalry that landed behind them. And, and even though these were veteran soldiers, their horses were just uh, skittish. The cannonball goes off, and these guys are rocking on their horses. And sure enough, one of them, a little too tight on the trigger, pulls the trigger and shoots the guy in front of him, shoot, knocks him out of his horse. Forbes says, oh no, we can't have that. So he dismounts the men, has the horses taken back to the rear by a private, and uh, gets his men ready to receive this charge. Mosby did not use a, uh, anything but a, a fox whistle to sound attack or retreat. He didn't use a bugle, he didn't use a drum, any other thing like that. So he blows his fox whistle, and here these young men come out, and he taught his men to put their thighs tight against the horse's body, and he taught them to shoot both left-handed and right-handed, so they could shoot a watermelon or a bottle with their left hand if they were right-handed, and, and vice versa and to put the reins in their teeth when they were come out screaming like wild men. And so again, as I said earlier, they can cover 150 yards and a horse going 25 or 30 miles an hour in just seconds. Well, these Federals would maybe the ones who had the presence of mind to pick up their rifles, had the presence of mind to fire one round, and they only had single-shot carbines, one round, and then they're done for the day. Out they go. Um, and the whole mob scene fades back. Um, Forbes being the incredible officer he was, and just like in the movies, just like in the movies, Mosby and Forbes see each other and they, they charge each other, okay? So <laughs> here, here is Forbes with a sword, and Mosby is armed with a pistol. And Mosby and Forbes, like they just <clears throat> run into each other. Forbes takes his sword and he's about ready to, he stabs at Mosby and he hits his coat. It's, Blade goes through his coat, pulls the sword back, and he doesn't have his sword knot on. He doesn't have his sword knot on. And the sword knot is designed, it's, it's, to, it's not just a decoration. You put it around your wrist, in case you lose your sword, or in case the sword falls, you have lost it, you can hold on to it. Well, he did not have his sword knot on. And the sword falls to the, to the ground. At the same instant, Mosby picks up his pistol, and at point blank range, starts to pull the trigger. At that instant, the horse rears his head, and the gun goes off and hits the horse in the neck, pinning Forbes to the ground. In those days, the, the federal uh, score of command, the way, they, the way they organized themselves, the non-coms were not prepared to take over from the officers if the officers were, were down. So if the commanding officer's down, then the, the, the second in command gets six bullets, and he's down. And then the lieutenant gets a couple, and he's down. The men have nowhere to go. There's nobody to take charge. Like, not like today, but back in those days, that's the way they were. And so there was this panic. All these men are just running, throwing their weapons down, and just, just running for daylight. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, Forbes' command had lost two-thirds, killed, wounded, and missing. So out of a hundred, uh, he lost almost 70. Killed, wounded, missing prisoners. Mosby lost one killed and six wounded. And this is one of those stories that just, just don't quite understand how it happened. Except that Mosby had the upper hand with his weapons. With the element of surprise, uh, he had the, the, the bravery, the courage of these young men. Um, and the Federals just they just, uh, just ran. You know, the Confederate soldier brought his own horse. The Yankee soldier was issued one. It's a big, big difference in that. So now to my question. Uh, we can stop now and take, I can take a few questions uh, and call it a day.
today, or I can go on for a little while. What's the pleasure of group? What? Go on. Go on. Who wants to, somebody want to stop? Want to stop here? We want to go on. Let's go on. Go on. Okay. Um, I will talk about the wagon train raid. Um, in fact, I've already talked about the wagon train raid. I will talk about the uh, Stevens Hill at Salem. Anything thank you all for coming today. Um, sure. We are going to do some time. Oh, good. okay. Fine. Then we'll just we'll just uh, call it uh, an afternoon right now. I will take uh, some questions. I expect it would be. I expect it would be. I said, Ted's a little weapon. The question was that uh, you believe that the one of the favorite weapons of the Southern Cavalry was a solid shotgun. Is that true? I think it is absolutely true. Double barrel. Double barrel, yes. Sir. I heard after the war that the wearing of the Confederate uniform was prohibited by yeah. law. But John Salem and Mosby are dressed in full Virginia and marked down the center of State Street in Bristol, Virginia, and nobody bothered to say <laughs> I don't know about that, but I'd not be surprised. I, I know that in, um, in Leesburg, uh, Virginia, he was, uh, it was on uh, April 9th, 1866. And Mosby showed up in his colonel's uniform with the three stars and the buttons and all this stuff. And uh, he was walking down the street. In fact, he showed up across the street from the provost marshal's office. And uh, the PM comes out and this young lieutenant, he says, uh, he says, the war is over, sir. You know, the buttons go and the, you know, the stars go and all that. And Mosby says, no, they don't. <laughs> no, they don't. And he said, you can try to take them off. Go ahead. Try to take him off. And he walked across the street and, and into a, in, across the field, and they, they started chasing him and shooting at him, but they never hit him. <coughs> he just like, he was in your face with it. A couple more questions? Hey, look, Sir? I read where uh, Mosby met George Patton, George Patton Jones. Yes, correct. That's right. Yes. Patton's family was from Virginia, they were right. California. That's right. Mosby went to California. That's correct. After Mosby came back from Hong Kong, uh, he ended up working for the Southern Pacific Railroad for 16 years. Um, it was Ulysses Grant on his deathbed, the day before Grant died in 1885. The day before he died, he sent a telegram to Leland Stanford, who owned the Southern Pacific Railroad, 